Hey everybody, this is Eric Lopez, also known as Blue Beetle and the Scarab. And you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D-0-5. Hello team, thanks for joining us for our first installment of Elseworlds, a new series brought to you by our backers at Patreon. In Elseworlds, we'll be doing deep dives into the amazing catalog of DC animated movies. My name's Rich, and this week, I'm joined by the amazing producer, Neil. Hey, that's me. And in this series, we'll be discussing the comic history that inspired the movies, how the stories might have changed or been updated, and in some cases, how they have inspired or will inspire storylines in Young Justice. So guess what? This is your spoiler warning. (laughs) We're getting it out of the way right in the beginning. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com and at, at our email address whelmedpodcast at gmail.com I know I failed you but I tried to save you Jason I'm I'm trying to save you now is that what you think this is about that you let me die I don't know what cloud your judgment worse your guilt or your antiquated sense of morality Bruce I forgive you for not saving me But why? Why on God's earth? Is he still alive? (laughs) Ignoring what he's done in the past, blindly, stupidly disregarding the entire graveyards he's filled, the thousands who have suffered, the friends he's crippled. You know, I thought... I thought I'd be the last person you'd ever let him hurt. If it had been you that he'd beat to a bloody pulp, if he had taken you from this world, I would have done nothing but search the planet for this pathetic pile of evil death-worshipping garbage and send him off to hell. And with that housekeeping out of the way, let's hand it back to Neil for... Hello, Megan. For this one, we are looking back at Batman Under the Red Hood, and I'm super excited. But it was released in July of 2010, and the director was um, – maybe I will pronounce this correctly, but I – Brandon Vietti? Does that sound right? Yeah, some, uh, some guy. Okay, some, yeah. And some guy. The, the voice director was the legendary Andrea Romano. And for our voice cast, we have Bruce Greenwood as Batman, Jensen Ackles as Red Hood, John DiMaggio as the Joker, Neil Patrick Harris as Nightwing. So excited. Jason Isaacs as Raish. Wade Williams is Black Mask, Gary Cole is Jim Gordon, and then just a list of classic actors and voice actors playing a range of parts, including Kelly Hu, who played Cheshire in Young Justice, Brian George, Phil Lamar, Kevin Michael Richardson, and Dwight Schultz, pulling up some supporting class roles. And with that, let's dive into our mission briefing. Just in time for your next mission. So for the pre-credits, we jump over to Rachel Ghoul, who realizes... I don't know why he didn't realize it earlier, but his mistake in allying with the Joker to use him as a distraction as he's trying to take over and destroy Europe's financial districts. And in Sarajevo, Bosnia, the Joker brutally assaults Jason Todd, the second Robin, in an abandoned warehouse. Jason is locked in the warehouse with a bomb, which explodes and kills him before Batman can arrive. Yeah. Rage. What were you thinking? Uh, In our post credit scene... Uh, We're five years later in Gotham City, where a criminal calling himself the Red Hood assembles a meeting of the city's chief thugs and drug dealers. He announces a takeover of their trade, taking 40% of the profit in return for protection from Black Mask and Batman. We cut over to Batman stopping an attempted theft of a shipment belonging to Black Mask, which is the advanced android Amazo that we saw in Young Justice. Batman destroys Amazo with the help of Jason's predecessor, Nightwing, and discovers yes. that the thieves are working for Red Hood. Uh, kind of, right? Because yeah. he shoots them first. 
<laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. They chase Red Hood uh, to Ace Chemicals, while well, Batman does, where an explosion destroys the facility and nearly kills Batman. Batman and Nightwing head on over and start interrogating the Joker about the Red Hood. The Joker denies any involvement. Black Mask decides to put a hit out on Red Hood for Amazo's destruction, which was Batman and Nightwing's fault, but that's fine. Batman and Nightwing prevent Red Hood from hijacking Black Mask's next shipment. They chase Red Hood to a train station where Red Hood escapes after detonating a bomb, which ends up injuring Nightwing. Batman and Nightwing realize Red Hood is trained and has knowledge of Batman's tactics and gadgetry. A review of the footage of the chase reveals that the Red Hood knows Batman's secret identity. He then recalls Jason performing the same maneuvers as Red Hood and that Jason grew more violent as he aged. I love that scene with Joker. He's like, are you going to do it this time? <laughs> so good. He's like, well, okay, I guess you're not. Yeah. Uh, moving on. Yeah. Black Mask hires the fearsome Hand of Four to take out Red Hood. And they lure him out by attacking Tyler Bramford, which is one of the gang leaders that's under Red Hood's protection. Uh, they nearly take down Red Hood. He impressively keeps the four of them off of him for a long period of time <laughs> uh, until Batman shows up, uh, helps incapacitate three of them. But Red Hood kills the fourth. Uh, horrifying Batman. Red Hood clearly explains he's doing what Batman would not. Killing criminal scum who are not afraid. Batman offers to help Red Hood and maybe pull him back to the light side, but Hood refuses uh, and disappears. Batman grabs a blood sample that he got off of one of the Batarangs, takes it back to the Batcave, and confirms what he had already suspected, which is that Red Hood's DNA matches that of Jason. Dun, dun, dun. After discovering that Jason's body that's buried in on Wayne Manor is a fake, Batman confronts Ra's al Ghul and demands to know the truth. Ray says he felt responsible for Jason's death and as a peace offering, he had swapped Jason's <laughs> body for a fake to attempt to revive him in the Lazarus pit. Unfortunately, the insanity that often follows Raish after he is brought back from near death uh, drove Jason completely insane. Maybe because he was completely dead? Like, mm -hmm. not mostly dead. Definitely dead. Uh, and uh, Jason... Uh, <laughs> ends up throwing himself out a window off of a cliff uh, a la Bucky in <laughs> Captain mm -hmm. America. Uh, and then they could not find the body afterwards. Later, Then we cut back to Gotham City uh, where Black Mask is uh, almost killed by Red Hood. Pretty close. Not quite. Uh, which pushes Black Mask over the edge and he uses all of his pull and contacts to set Joker free asking him to sorry i'm just thinking of the scene where he's talking to joker and joker just kills all of his men oh yeah Instantly. i'm gonna need some guys not these guys they're dead <laughs> <laughs> we're black masks so he sets joker free and tax tasks him with killing the red hood the Joker ends up actually abducting Black Mask and all of the crime bosses, and Red Hood reveals that his real target is actually the Joker. That's pretty on brand for Joker. I don't know what Black yeah. Mask was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to put put in the outline. <laughs> Black Mask decides to make the same mistake Rachel Gould does. <laughs> <laughs> Batman saves the hostages, and Red Hood takes the Joker. Red Hood brutally assaults the Joker in revenge for his own murder, and then confronts Batman. During the fight, Red Hood removes his helmet, confirming that he is Jason Todd. He holds Batman at gunpoint, forgives him for not saving him, but asks why the Joker is still alive. Batman says that he wants to kill the Joker, but will not, fearing that he will not stop if he kills once. <clears throat> so Jason tosses Batman a gun and gives him an ultimatum. Either he can kill the Joker or Jason will, and the only way to stop Jason from doing it is for Batman to shoot him. Batman, surprise, refuses to do this, and Jason begins shooting at him, at which point Batman throws a, bat throws a batarang, clogging the barrel of the gun, which causes it to explode, in turn defeating Jason, who then, of course, had enough forethought to have a bomb prepared and sets it off. Joker and Batman survive, and Jason is nowhere to be found. 
Joker is returned to Arkham, and Black Mask is arrested for his involvement in the Joker's escape. And then we get a just a brutal flashback yep. showing Jason's first day as Robin, which he declares is the best day of his life. Gut punch. C- credits roll. So good. I have a ton of Aster for this one. I was super excited that uh, our, our Patreon backer that, uh, that, that pushed us over the top um, for this new segment, Trent Boyd, uh, we, we let him pick which movie we were going to do first, and he uh, he chose this one, which we were very excited about. Yes. Let's go. It's awesome. Aster. Aster it up. Dipper boy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. Uh, well, I have to start off with saying, like, uh, I never expected in my life <laughs> for that opening scene from Death and the Fam to ever be animated, ever. And I'm like, oh, Under the Red Hood. Huh, cool. I, I, I don't think I'd read the arc before I saw the movie. I knew what, I knew what happened in the arc. But I just, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, they're bringing Jason Todd back. Oh, goody. I'm so glad I wasted my 50 cents when I voted for him to die. <laughs> um, but I also knew that it was written by Judd Winnick, and I am a huge Judd Winnick fan. He's a great writer uh, and a great creator. So I was like, all right, I'm not really going to read the comic. I think that was my, hype, my, my, my thought process. I'm not going to go out of my way to find that. But this movie came out. I'll check it out, see what it's like. Opening scene, beaten to death with a crowbar. <laughs> John DiMaggio did a great job as Joker. It's mm-hmm. super hard, super hard to, to follow up Joker from Mark Hamill. And, yeah. uh, and John DiMaggio has done a ton of stuff. So... Uh, his voice is so familiar, it would be hard not to have... It he, he does like Jake the dog in Adventure Time and that kind of stuff. Well, he's Bender. Yeah, and he's Bender, right? So it, it's... Yeah, that was the big stumbling block for me, both that and getting past it not being Mark Hamill. Right. That's a big, that's which, a big deal for which me. Which sucks for any actor, right? But I mean, John DiMaggio's like... Br- he's brilliant. He's really good. He has a distinctive voice, so how do you make it not Bender or not Jake? Mm-hmm. Right. So, but he did it. He pulled it off. And I think in many ways he pulled it off by not like Mark Hamill cranked it up. And I think John DiMaggio turned it down. Like that scene we were talking about earlier where Batman's got him, you know, uh, in Arkham up against the wall and he gets real serious and he's like, are you going to do it this time? Or are you just going to put me in a body cast for six months? Right. But it's, it's actually, it's not a joke. He's not laughing. It's just like you and me, eye to eye, personal, right? And I think I think he did a brilliant job with that, which is tough to pull off. And it's the same thing with Bruce Greenwood. When I heard Bruce, I like Bruce Greenwood, but I heard he was doing the voice. I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. And then I, at first it was weird because, of course, it's not Kevin Conroy. And some of the other Batman actors I haven't been super excited about, they're okay. But then about halfway through, I was like, he's good. Like, really, really good. Like, he should be the next Batman good. Which, actually, when he then showed up in Young Justice, oh my gosh. I was so happy that I was going to get to hear Bruce Greenwood as Batman all the time. He's so good. But that opening scene, man. Opening scene. And and Jason, like, his resolve Mm -hmm. in his eyes when he's like, yep, this is it. And then blows up. And Emily, so uh, one of the reasons why Emily hasn't joined us uh, for this, we're, we're hoping to get at least two, if not all three of us on some of these movie reviews. Emily's just doing all the things. <laughs> so this yep. is a time of year at school where she is just doing everything. She's like in a play and she's got papers and all that stuff. But she did take the time to watch the movie and throw us some notes. And one of the things that she had said here, uh, she said the pre-credits opening is great on so many levels. It establishes everything we need to know about the backstory if you're not familiar with the comic because none of that flashback ever happened in the comic, right? They assume you know what the history is or they yep. or Jed Winnick folds it into the story as it goes on in like eight eight issues or something, right? But you get to you know how what Jason's personality is and something that I didn't notice that she pointed out was the fact that he has no dialogue. So Jen, Jensen Ackles isn't doing the voice of grown-up Jason. Right, he isn't doing that voice. So, because he's not doing that voice, you don't get that tie-in to who he could be in the future. Right, this five years later, 
which I thought was really, really good. But like, like spitting in Joker's face and like that resolve we were talking about and all that kind of stuff, like uh, amazing, amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> Just absolutely brilliant. And then also, like speaking of Batman and, and Bruce Greenwood too, you see him using a fighting style that's kind of echoey of the one he gets in Young Justice. It's not big, open, giant, fluid uh, movements like he was in the comics back when this, like when mm-hmm. Death in the Family was really originally written. It's that really tight, close in knees, elbows, like in your face, like right in your space. Like other people are trying to get some, get some speed and inertia with these big punches, and he's all right in, in close. And you see a lot of that echoey here too, which I'd be interested to find out. I really want to talk to Greg and Brandon about how they did the all the different fighting styles in Young Justice and how that worked, but I don't know how they do it with some of these action-oriented shows. If I were going to take a crack at that idea, I mean, I think part of it would be the transition of the idea that everyone is going to have a gun, and if he is going to use a martial arts style that is similar to the big open, that means big and shot. I mean, so the close quarters, because he oh, doesn't right. ever want to he doesn't want to have a reach. gun. Yep. yep, and he never wants to be using a gun, and so then he just closes the gap because that is one of the most effective ways to start dealing with that kind of thing. That's a really, really good point. I never thought about that. And then I know that in like Avatar: The Last Airbender and these shows that are really focused on martial arts, like they had the they had one consultant in this particular case of Avatar. They had one consultant who knew all four different styles of Kung Fu that they were using in Avatar. And so he was there as their main consultant. So he was like, they were like, all right, so if we're going to do, you know, airbending or earthbending or whatever, what do you think would be best? And, and he'd be like, okay, well, this is what, what you should use because the way that it looks right. The earthbending is that stomping Mm -hmm. style and that kind of stuff. But when you're talking about a show like, like justice league, the animated series, everybody had very different, like black Canary's fighting style was very different than, than Batman's. Right. Or Superman's for that matter, which is basically just throwing punches. But you know what I mean? You have to think about how things are going to be different. And if you watch the fight scene in second season of Young Justice, where the whole Bat family is there, it's like Tim and Tim and and Dick and Barbara are all fighting slightly differently and very differently from Bruce, which makes me like, well, if he's training them, then did he he was like, no, this this is the style that works for me. Mm-hmm. But I'm not as acrobatic as Dick, so we need to get Dick something else, right? Yep. And it, and Tim fights, at least from the comics, Tim fights smart. He's not a brawler, right, like Jason, or, or even as athletic as Dick. So he has to fight with intelligence, right? I can't get the strength. I can't get the speed. So I need to hit you right where it hurts, and that's it, like quick and down, right? Which I which I love. So I would just wonder if they have you know, do they get martial arts consultants and, and is it is it martial arts consultants to the animation studio or do they trust the animation studio? I just have no idea how any of that works. And I'm fascinated by the whole idea. Well now we're gonna have to find out. I know. And I also I and my immediate thought was also at what point do people like Brandon and Greg just know? You know I mean? There's so much experience in doing that kind of thing. Yeah. When do they just not need a consultant anymore? Yeah. So, but what do they do then? Because the animation studios are overseas usually. And so if they say like, okay, look, we want this martial art. Like, how does the action sequence directed? I don't know. I I have so many questions. If anybody else knows, like get, (laughs) get, get to us. I got to We got, uh, as we mentioned in the Intel update that was released recently, like Greg and Brandon are up for coming on the show. They just need to, they just need to get an okay from, from Warner. So I'm I'm putting together a list of questions. So if uh, you guys can already start sending us questions, and we'll collect it in some docs, and so for when we finally get them on the show. Uh, but switching away from from Bruce Greenwood and Batman for a minute, and, and even even Jason Todd, Nightwing is in this. Yeah, and it's Nightwing voiced by Neil Patrick Harris. I was like, this is like my perfect casting on this. And. When he first showed up on that C train, I was like, oh, oh, okay. You don't have a mullet, and I'm 100% on board. Because <laughs> there was a chance. There was a, that he there was was a chance he was going to have a mullet. Wicked mullet. Uh, so I've been, I mean, I used to watch Doogie Hauser way back in the day, and, and Neil Patrick Harris, I have, this, I have this odd connection to Neil Patrick Harris. I used to get called Doogie a lot as a kid, and then I became a nurse. 
And so then I was walking around in scrubs in the ICU, and people would call me Doogie all the time uh, because we look a little bit alike. Not quite so much mm-hmm. now that I'm a little older. Maybe we'll post some comparison shots I have. But in addition to that, here's the really weird part. We have the same birthday. Oh, no way. Yeah, we were both born on June 15th. I'm, I think I have two years on him. He's a, he's a little younger than me. But we both have the same birthday, too. Super weird. But I've just been connected to him and love him as an actor. I love him as a person. I just think he's really cool. And then you, then you put him doing the voice of Nightwing, and he's so funny. Oh, he's like, the, do, you, his do you want me to? Uh, well, I guess I'll just take care of this then. You know? <laughs> Can you once just say, let's get in yes. the car? <laughs> that was my favorite line. It was all... <laughs> oh, it stood out so, so mad. Did he just say thank you? So weird. <laughs> so good. What a great casting. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. All of that early dialogue really stood out to me as being really good. And then you know, as the movie went on, you and it focused a lot more on Jason Todd and the Red Hood and things like that. But that early dialogue was just between Alfred and Dick and Bruce. Also, like the weird level of discussion he was willing to have with the criminals after he kind of figured out that they got duped into picking up a Mazo. Oh, yeah. Like, what's that? It's a Mazo. He's a really advanced android robot that takes over the power of superheroes. Which ones? Really big ones. Big ones. I'm, like, I'm like, why are you telling them this? Right. I'm like, it's. I know it's more for me as the viewer right. than the criminal that you stuck to this truck who now might die because of it. But that's just me. Well, I get it. And it's one of those lines where you have to look at, like, it's like whenever you're writing a novel or you're writing anything, mm-hmm. at, the, at the start of the novel... It's okay in many ways, depending on how you're phrasing it, it's okay for characters to refer to other characters they typically know by name, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be invisible to the reader because they don't know this person and they don't know the relationship, right? Maybe on a reread, they'd be like, oh, it's weird that they called him Jim when he knows he's Jim, you know, like that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But it, it, it's, it's like... Um, a lot of writers will, this is kind of a strange aside, but a lot of writers will want to um, spice up their dialogue tags. So instead of saying like, you know, can you once say, let's get in the car, you know, like Nightwing said, right? Alfred said, right? They're just like, oh, I'm typing said all the time. That sounds boring because I'm seeing it a million times, but it's an invisible tag. It's, the problem is people will be like, they espoused, they breathed right? They yelled, they argued, right? And that ends up jumping out because it should be evident in the dialogue that you're using what tone and what what's happening generally. But in here, you have to kind of put stuff like that in because otherwise we don't know who Amazo is. And this, for me, it kind of worked okay. Like I hear where you're coming oh, yeah. from, but it kind of worked okay because it's almost like Batman saying like, let me tell you how stupid you are, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, yeah. this is what you unleashed, Moron, now I have to go take care of business. I hope you don't die. Oh, well. And then also the, the, the bad guys having the conversation about Nightwing falls in the same, yep. same category, right? Who's the pretty boy in the leotard, right? Nightwing, the first Robin. And that's, that was interesting to me, too, because I've always wondered, is that public knowledge? Like, is it public knowledge that the old Robin is now Nightwing? I mean, it would be obvious when, they, when he switched to to Jason, although in the comics, Jason was a little bit, was older, right? So Dick Mm -hmm. became Nightwing when he was maybe 18, and then Jason joined him when he was like 13, I think. I'm not sure the exact time frame, but he was was a teenager, like much older than Dick was when he started. And so people could tell the difference between a 13 or 14-year-old and 18-year-old. So probably people assumed that it was a new one, but did like dick make an announcement like is it obvious that this new nightwing character is robin i don't know it was interesting to me that one of the criminals were like hey that's the first that's the first robin yes which i think that and a few other things get to another thing that emily had brought up oh yeah but i don't know if i don't know if we want to jump over to there and in in the movie he looks much younger but in the comics i think it was different because in the movie, when Jason first becomes Robin, he does look like he's like nine or ten, right? Are you talking about those those parallel flashback, those kind of missions that showed Jason as a little kid and then Jason as a little older, darker teenager? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, 
Well, also the idea of when um, Jason mentions the friends he's crippled with the potential of it referring to Batgirl. Oh. And for whatever, you know, there's no pre existing movies. This isn't following something else, but th- this is a lived world that, you know, just kind of assumes Batman things have happened. Right. Um, so I really like the idea of that also playing into. They know that Rob, the first Robin turned into Nightwing. Right. They, is this referring to Batgirl as the person that was crippled? It's got, I, it's got to be. Yeah. Emily had said yeah. that she'd, she'd made a comment about the friends who crippled and she said, uh, she said she couldn't decide whether she loved it, that it kind of felt like this, you know, bigger universe thing, kind of like Young Justice does. Um, or she kind of hated the fact that. It was, there was a reference to Batgirl and Oracle wasn't in it in the story and Batgirl wasn't in the story. Like nothing was referred to. Right. And her statement was it's a, it's an extremely tight, well-written, well-paced film uh, that didn't bother with a lot of subplots, you know, to keep focused on telling one story. So she's like, I, I totally understand why Batgirl wasn't in it for keeping it, you know, laser focused on what it was trying to do. But there's also like no women in this. <laughs> There's no women in this story yeah. at all. And as I was reading, I was just rereading through uh, the original story arc as well. There's very few there as well. There's a couple of characters that get introduced in that in that arc, but but not many. So, as a matter of fact, I think in the in the original comic, one of the crime lords that was around the table when Red Hood was, you know, making the deal at the beginning was actually a woman as mm. well. And I don't, I'd have to rewatch the scene from the movie again, but I don't think any. I think they were all guys. So yeah, I mean the only person, the only female dialogue that happened consistently was black masks assistant played by kelly kelly who yeah the other one that like threw me off because i think i saw this before i was like re-watching the film so i kind of had an eye out for it in the scene where they put jason back into the lazarus pit and it's kind of going around talia is totally there no dialogue, no oh, anything. Oh, yeah. But she's standing right behind Raish as Jason pops back out. Interesting. Yeah. I was just like, oh, okay. Missed, missed opportunity. Yeah, missed <laughs> opportunity. But, I mean, again, you're drawing. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in a segment in a segment that we're gonna, where we're going to break down the differences between the movie and the comic, too. So we'll, we can talk about some of that stuff there. But um, Perfect. I agree with Emily. There's some, maybe some missed opportunities there. But Emily had also, in relation to what we're talking about with Jason growing up and how old he was and all that kind of stuff, she had also made a mention, which was pretty good, uh, which I totally agree with, was these these two flashbacks that they show Jason as Robin in the original outfit, which I really like because he was in the original mm-hmm. outfit in the comics back in the day. And then when he got older, they put him in the older outfit in the in the movie which is not what happened in the comics because that new outfit that we see a lot in young justice and in batman the animated series and when jason's older here that didn't show up until jason had died and tim became robin because batman was yep. like oh maybe i should bulletproof this <laughs> maybe i should give him more gear and equipment maybe i should make that cloak dark on the outside at least right like yeah so the the, the tabby boots and the, all the stuff that was changed that was all that was all when tim came around as a result of jason dying um but it still showed this tone shift uh that that emily was talking about yeah. the color palette changes the 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 first fight with robin with uh, uh riddler was very four color very you know little kid idea of you know like what fighting supervillains would be like and then you get the whole thing where he breaks that guy's collarbone and puts him in shock and like all that kind of stuff, which I think was interesting watching that change in Robin. Yeah. And you know, and genuine, it felt genuinely apologetic about doing it, but not that he would have done something different. Right. Like it's, and in the comic, that's what happened in, in a death in the family. He would do that kind of stuff. He just wasn't listening. And he was always so like just angst ridden and angry and bitter and, it was just hard. Also, though, Bruce was written back in the day, and particularly in that comic. He wasn't very sympathetic either. Like, I thought <laughs> I was helping him, but I'm not really helping him. Uh, and well, I'll do a little bit of a dive into a death in the family and why Robin, why, why Jason was actually in the Middle East and how Joker got him and all that kind of stuff in a little bit. But, but anyway, there was another scene that, uh, that Emily brought up that I didn't catch, which is when Red Hood takes off his helmet mm-hmm. for that first time. There's this lightning flash and there's a split second shot of Jason wearing the old Robin outfit, uh, like bruised, broken teenager, like from the very beginning. 
Yep. It must be super quick because I've seen this movie a lot. And if I registered it, I I don't remember it. So I mean, it would be a f- frame or two at most. Yeah. And so, yeah, you see it and it's definitely you know, in the torn mask, bruised and broken. And yeah, it's it's crazy. And this is a kind of thing that you you can do in comics, but not that effectively. This is kind of the thing that this is a thing that you do when you're translating a comic into another medium, Mm -hmm. right? Because comics can do a lot of things that TV shows can't because of implications of things between in the gutters, between the panels that are really interesting. If you want to read all about that, go pick up uh, Scott McCloud's understanding comics. There's so much interesting stuff in there psychologically and, and like mentally and how your brain works. It's amazing. But when you're translating from a comic into another medium, you kind of want to use the strengths of that medium. And in this particular case, if you had put a panel like a lightning flash where he looks at like his whole his old beaten person and then the lightning flash goes away, you could do it in a series of panels, but it doesn't have that kind of visceral effect as it would have doing it cinematized uh, cinematographically in. Is that a word? I think it is uh, in in a in a movie like this. Yeah, I mean it's it's very difficult, and I I know I I used to buy a lot more physical comics. I do almost everything digital now um, because I can just carry hundreds, if not thousands, on my iPad. And I usually do the like assisted view where you double click and it takes you panel by panel. Oh, I love that because I have a terrible tendency to open a page and my eyes are just like, "What's at the end?" And it's just like, "No, you've ruined it for yourself. Why would you do this?" <laughs> But the, yeah, it would be very difficult to get that same feel in a comic. Right, because your eyes can linger on a space. And, mm-hmm. and if you're writing a comic that's like that, like Watchmen is perfect for that because there's so many details that are in the background. Or a, or a book like uh, Top Ten, which is fantastic, which has this incredibly rich world that's going on in the background. And every single panel is making some pulp culture reference to other worlds and other dimensions and other properties. Like it's crazy what's going on in the background. You can hang out there forever and break that down, which is harder to do in a show. It it just, it's just hard. You can do it, but it's just not quite the same. So using the strengths of the medium you're translating into or out of. Right. But I want to focus on the ending. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on during this. It's really great. Like during the whole show, like kind of the buildup to who he is the recording, the whole the whole thing where he records his voice and takes the train out and the reveal of him saying Bruce. Like, I knew who Red Hood was, and it gave me chills. Yeah. Which was amazing. And that's not in the comics. How he finds out is subtly different in the comics. Oh. So they don't have the whole, you know, Fearsome Four fight and that kind of stuff. And Jason literally takes a batarang and cuts his own, like, hair and head, like, cuts his scalp for blood and hair to hand to Batman to check the DNA. So like it's different in the comics than it is here, but that scene was so effective and I just loved it. But the ending, there's so many, like you're so set up to not like this guy, right? Like, okay, well, if he is Jason Todd, Mm -hmm. he's crazy. He's a super villain. Why is Batman like care about him and that kind of stuff. But when he says, when Bruce says like, I'm sorry, I didn't save you. That's what we think. We think he's pissed because Batman didn't save him. Right. In addition to wanting to do what he thinks Batman wouldn't do, Mm -hmm. except the way that it's delivered. Jensen Ackles did a good job, man. Got to give it to him because he was just like, that's what? Like, I forgive you for not saving me, Bruce. But for God's sake, why is he still alive? And Mm -hmm. and at first you're like, okay, well, yeah, but you're a murderous psychopath. So that makes sense. But then the next statement is if he had taken you away from me is how he phrases it. Like, yeah. if he had taken you away from me, I would have hunted him to the ends of the earth. Like, implying, like, you did not feel this way about me. Like, you didn't love me the way that I loved you. And that is the first time, I think, in my life I ever felt sympathy for Jason Todd. Like, hats off, because that was amazing and totally understandable situation. It was yeah. It was just presented so gen- again, so genuine and with such sound logic for in in terms of how Jason viewed it. In that, you know, I mean, Bruce, I understand that you feel you couldn't protect me or you feel like you couldn't save me, but that doesn't make sense. That part is the Joker's fault, right? 
And so is everything that happened after that. Yeah. That's my point, Bruce, is the Joker did this. Why were there not equal and ample repercussions for him? Because you know full well what he did to me. Yeah. And it's tough. Like, I, I, I hate story arcs where Batman's killing people. I hate it when he ca- mm-hmm. where he's, when he's carrying guns and gunning people down. Like, I, I just don't like it. It's just not who he is as a character. But Jason's got some really good points, you know, in this. Like, your moral stance, Bruce, caused other people to be dead, right? And this is the question. So in the 90s, there were a lot of people saying, like, why doesn't Batman kill, right? We've talked about this on the show a little bit. Like, we want, we want, we want our Punishers, we want our Wolverines, like, we want our dark heroes. And so they brought in Bane, they broke Bruce's back, he was out of the comics for a year, they gave, instead, Dick didn't want the mantle, right? So they, instead, they gave uh, the mantle of Batman to a character named Azrael, who makes a powered armored suit Whoa. and just starts murdering people, right? Yeah. <laughs> so and they're like, hey, here's our point. Our point is this is why, this is, this is not who Batman is, right? I think Jason, as Red Hood, and in this movie and in the comic that, that accompanies it, this is a much better exploration, like a much more subtle and more personal exploration of the morality of what and who Batman is versus versus Jason. Because Jason is more... I, I was literally trained by you. I know everything you know, and I'm going to use this to do something different. He's the Batman who kills. And you either really like it or you don't, but you get both. And you can make that choice. And their relationship in history makes him more an anti-hero, right? Well, and it, it lends itself to like a deeper and much more passionate discussion like we saw in the end scenes of, no, I wanted to kill the Joker every single day since you have been gone. But that's the easiest thing for me to do. Right. And from a writing standpoint, too, just just from a writing, let's talk about mechanics. Punisher has some good stories. Wolverine has some really good stories. They have very, they, they, they handle things in a very direct manner, right? I get that. Batman doesn't kill, and because he doesn't kill, it forces a writer to have to think differently, think deeper, and think about solving problems without him having to do the easiest thing. And if you're like, yeah, but the best thing would be for him just to gun people down, I'm like, okay, yeah, but anybody can do that. Not everybody can solve the problem without doing that, and that makes it a harder thing to write or create, in my opinion. <clears throat> it reminds me of, like, from a video game standpoint, I don't know if anybody played Splinter Cell back in the day. Great game, one of the first and best stealth shooter games. But one of the, one of the, the missions, you had to sneak into CIA headquarters and get this guy out without being seen. And there was, like, four ways to get into the building and to do all this stuff. But the thing was, you couldn't kill anyone. And in other parts of the missions and other ways of doing things, you could choose to go into missions without killing anybody. But if you killed somebody and they found the body or you knocked somebody out and they found the body, then you get an alarm would go off and the game was over. And so it made things you had to think you couldn't just go in guns blazing. That's a lot of fun, like Halo or whatever. But like, Mm -hmm. you know, very different. And the same thing happens to the writing. And so when I see him pick up a gun or there's guns mounted on his vehicles and that kind of stuff, I'm just like, okay, I, I can't help but think that it just feels like lazy writing to me. Or you think you're trying to make a point, but it's a point that's been explored for decades and it's not a fresh take. I don't know. It's hard, right? But with Jason, this makes total sense to me. Total sense to me. Yeah, and I love it. Yeah. I love Jason so Todd good. as Red Hood. Yep. I did not like him as Robin. He's a terrible Robin. <laughs> because he wasn't being him he wasn't allowed to be him you know what i mean as a character yeah rich pulled up all his allowance money and murdered jason todd <laughs> i did <laughs> there was a shirt at a con i saw it said i i killed jason todd i almost bought it um yeah uh, but then then we go back to the joker and all these plot twists and turns at the end the moral exploration and all that kind of stuff but then joker the whole time <laughs> It's just brilliant. Oh, yeah. Where you you eagle-eyed, goth-loving marksman, right, 
you managed oh, yeah. you manage to save everyone and everyone loses and then like <laughs> J- then like red hood starts the bomb and then batman goes to save it and he stop it and he's all no don't spoil it this is better i'm the only one who gets what he wants tonight <laughs> yes like, this is so good yeah it's so good and then and then you get the callback of batman searching through an exploded building and instead of finding jason he finds joker yep i'm like whoa you get that call back and then followed by that thing we already talked about this flashback of jason running around in the robin outfit saying this is the best day of my life it's just callback and tight and gut punches and emotional twists and questioning it's just so good so good and i think that's one of the things that really helped dimaggio be joker is because the joker was written so well yeah so well, and he delivered it so well. And I, I, you got to give Andrea Romano credit because oh, yeah. she's the one who's directing them, and she's she's brilliant. I'm so I get she's retired now, which I I totally get. Oh yeah, wish her wish her the best. Man, she was good, just so good. And you know, I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but like, you know, I'm just not I'm just not a fan of bringing characters back from the dead. Happens all mm-hmm. the time in the yep. comics, but it's a bummer. Jean Grey was dead for a long time. Yeah. And it was in the comics were interesting. And then they brought her back like that angst in the follow up. And then they brought her back. Right. Barry was the hero who died, quote unquote. Right. And, and then he came back. Green Arrow died in a really interesting way and then came back. Um, well, I mean, it, admittedly, uh, Marvel got really mad at Fox and killed a bunch of people that they own the movie rights to. So we right. had that to, to right. kind of hang our hats yeah, that, on for a that, bit. That's, that's true. And then uh, as uh, as Jeff Stormer mentioned in our Ted Cord Blue Beetle episode, like now Ted Cord kind of fills that yep. role of the hero who died, right? And so Jason died. He was dead. He was dead for a long time. And I was like, that's great. Man. So when they first created Jason Todd, I think I talked about this a little bit in our Robin Secret Origins episode, but when Jason Todd was first created, he was literally a carbon copy of Dick. Mm-hmm. He was a circus acrobat. His parents died. Like, the whole deal. He was basically just Dick. And then right after that, they uh, had Crisis on Infinite Earths, and they changed the origin, and they're like, we can't have him be a carbon copy of Dick. We've got to make him his own character. And ironically, I, I 100% understand their process. I back yeah. their process. You have to have someone who's different. Unfortunately, he was so different that he just could not be a Robin, Right. But again, as Red Hood, Jason comes into his own. He's allowed to have who he is, the decisions he's making make sense, why he's rebellious makes sense, what he's doing makes sense, why he thinks he's a hero makes sense. Everything makes sense. Yep. And if he comes back in Young Justice in a later season, I want some episodes. I want more than just an episode. I really want, I mean, I don't have a problem. I'm one of those people who don't have a problem with the time jumps. I do not want Red Hood just showing up without something happening like i want to see young justice's version yeah. of what happened right same thing with oracle if barbara gets shot and she ends up being oracle or not even shot if she ends up in a wheelchair for whatever reason i want to know why i want to know why she's in the wheelchair i want to know that story i want to know young justice's version because i'm hoping that they'll you know quote unquote improve <laughs> on some of the things that maybe some questionable fridging and treatment of women that we had in the past that led to that because i love oracle as a character oh yeah she's just amazing and again i think batgirl i i really enjoyed batgirl but barbara really came into her own when she became oracle right she got to be her own person not just an echo of batman a shadow of the bat so to speak so yeah i love it yeah did you have anything that i didn't cover that you jumped in on like the only two things and i'll go in reverse order of the way i wrote them down one is I cannot for the life of me figure out where as a viewer I would have figured out that it was Jason if I didn't already know that it was Jason. It was a very interesting thing to think about because you know in the second I'm watching it I know oh, where yeah. would I where would I have figured it out also trying to pin down where Bruce figures it out and like what is the line between I've figured this out intellectually because I'm one of the greatest detectives of all time, but emotionally, I don't want anything to do with figuring this out. I think when, I think, I really think it was after he cleaned up the voice. Mm-hmm. Yep. And 
part of me wonders how much was in the factory with the acid. Oh. Because he points a gun at him and he says, oh, this was your first mistake. But we essentially something to the effect of, but we know it wasn't your last. Mm. Oh, and you know what I just realized? I thought Red Hood was referring to his own death. But Jason was actually saying your 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 other mistake was not killing Joker. Mm. So where where we're led to believe as watchers and Batman's led to believe through the through the movie that Jason's pissed about yep. not being you know not being saved. It's that's not really what he's saying at all. Oh, yeah. uh, that's so interesting. I think it was after the track though because oh yeah, he'd, yeah. Ar- he'd already seen him do stuff that he knows he trained him to do. Like I I have this this idea of like. Batman's trained these kids to do stuff or sent them to be trained by someone to do these things. Like I could see like your fighting style becomes like a fingerprint. You know what I mean? Like I can see him looking at Jason and saying like, okay, he's bigger, he's taller, but these are definitely techniques that I taught him specifically to do. Mm -hmm. So I think it was, I think it was probably, it might've been in there, but well, yeah, because if when the DNA is confirmed, Alfred drops like the tray. Oh man, but what a great scene that was! Bruce doesn't really react, and then you know, and they go to the grave, they dig it up, and you know, and Alfred, poor Alfred, is like, "Oh, there he is!" And Bruce is like, "No!" and just picks up the body and throws it down. And yeah. Like, Woo. Hope hope Alfred tracked with you on that one because that would be jarring. <laughs> yeah, poor Alfred. I loved when. God, again, it's a, it's a subtle directing and subtle writing. Like, Bruce makes the DNA match. We've already suspected it, mm-hmm. right? If we didn't know already. Like, we already suspected it as watchers. We get the DNA match. Bruce kind of already was suspecting it, so he didn't have as much. Like, he, he knew that it might be a possibility. Yeah. But he hadn't told Alfred garbage. And so Alfred walks in and gets all of that in one space. Like, there's almost a betrayal you know what I mean? In that for Alfred, like, seriously, you didn't tell me that this might be a thing. Yeah. You and know, part, and part of me also thought that would Bruce have all, you know, because again, it's going back to the Emily talking about how it's a lived world of the idea that, you know, Bruce is still of the potential mind of like someone's messing with me and then right. immediately goes and like rents a backhoe and starts digging up the grave. <laughs> Yeah, that's I don't even know. Okay, anyway, right. <laughs> okay, so I will leave us as we switch to the next segment, but I will leave us with something. As a Marvel fan, I had to know and was actually surprised at finding out. Oftentimes we have characters that go between the two, the big two, that mm-hmm. are blatantly similar. And so you think to yourself, who was first? I was surprised that Black Mask came out 45 years after Red Skull. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, Red Skull was a World War II. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yep. So he was in the 40s, and then um, Black Mask was not until the 80s. Yeah. And Black Mask has some weird, like, is it a mask? Is it not a mask? It is a mask, but then there's other stuff. Like, you can go listen to... uh, our guests from Dames and Dragons uh, did a little mini secret origins on Black Mask yep. during their episode, which is pretty funny. So go back and listen to them. They're fantastic. But with that uh, Astro segment out of the way, we're going to uh, enter into a new segment that we are calling The Once and Future Past. See, I know stuff only a future boy would know. Dick Grayson, Tim Drake, Garfield Logan. Your name's Tim and yours is Dick? Oops, spoilers. This secret identity thing is so retro. And in the once and future past, we're going to be uh, taking a look at the comic and taking a look at the movie. And if the movie was inspired by the comic, we're going to do a bit of a dive and kind of see what's different and why. So uh, the original comic, of course, was called Batman Under the Red Hood, written by Judd Winnick, as I'd mentioned. Uh, it was a long arc that went on for, I think, eight issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, pencils were by Dun- Doug Mankey. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Paul Lee, Eric Battle, Shane Davis. Covers by Matt Wagner of uh, Grendel fame, Jock and Shane Davis. Uh, it was inked by Tom Nguyen, Cam Smith, Rodney Ramis, Wayne Foucher, and uh, Larry Strucker and Mark Morales. The colors were by Alex Sinclair, and it was lettered by a bunch of people. Pat Bruss- Brasso, Rob Lee, Phil Balsman, uh, Ken Lopez, Nick Napolitano, uh, Jared K. Fletcher, and Travis Lanham. They changed a lot from the comics, to be perfectly blunt. Like, there's a lot Mm -hmm. going on. 
And in the comics, like Mr. Freeze was working for Black Mask. They didn't open with a flashback to Jason's death. Batman in the comic was in a really bad place. A bunch of betrayal had happened and stuff, which which kind of gets reflected in the movie. Because when Nightwing shows up, Batman's like, get out of here. I don't want any help. Like, And in the comic, that's where his mentality was. Like, I need to do this alone. Like, he wasn't even using Oracle for stuff in the comic. Yep. The Amazo fight happens, but it's much later in the storyline. So Judd Winnick wrote the screenplay and he wrote the comic. Oh. And so he's a, he's a really good writer. Yeah. His book, Pedro and Me, from back in 2000, almost 20 years ago now, kind of crawled into my head and never left. Um, it was an amazing book. You should check it out if you haven't already. But what he did was, as a writer, he understood what the through line was. What is, what is the point of this? And what are we doing in the movie? And let's stick with that. So he rearranged things that happened at different times and plugged them together in different ways, took characters out, right? Stayed focused, like, like Emily was saying, like staying laser focused, right, on what the point was to get it on the screen. And I think it worked. Like when they change things in comics, in movies from a comic, I usually get, you know, it, it sometimes is a garbage fire. But in this case, just like with changing characters that go up on a screen or go onto, the, onto a TV show, or that kind of stuff. As long as you keep the heart of the character alive, I think it matters, and you can do other things to change that character. And in this case, I think it's what he did, but with a story. I really think that he focused on what was what mattered and stayed there. And it was perfect. I think it was perfect. Absolutely brilliant. Like, I mean, and of course it helps a ton that it was written by the same person for both. And also I think it did well that it wasn't as far removed from the original comic. You know, right. The original comic ran in the 2004, 2006 range. And you're talking roughly four years later, not right. 40 to 50, which is completely plausible when we start talking comics <laughs> right. as for to sure. where the storyline was pulled and things like there's just an inherent necessity. Like I've seen old comic clips of just the way words were used. You cannot say those things now. Like they right. just meant different things. Right. Um, so I think it did. It did well to pull a story that was so recent. And yeah, it is just so well written so yeah. like just tight there's nothing I'm, I'm trying to think if there's scenes extraneous scenes yeah that could be taken out the only the only the only thing i wasn't that excited about was this fearsome four group i didn't feel like was mm -hmm. i mean I, I i know where they're there in the story i guess but i don't know them and yeah. i just I, I don't know they just seemed like okay i guess you need someone to be able to fight him and show that he's awesome and then have batman show up and that kind of stuff but i felt like they could do it i felt like they could do it with an established group that's a little bit more familiar but maybe they just didn't have the option to do that I don't yeah know. and they and that scene definitely was means to an end in terms of how jason viewed it because you in the line right before batman swoops in is essentially something like yeah i've, I've essentially wasted enough time now batman's here my original plan yeah yeah right yeah i'm just stalling yep right exactly um, but another thing that they changed was kind of related to the comic, but not, but like, so in the flashback at the very beginning when he's, when he's, Jason's being killed by Joker, they don't really show or make reference to any of the main reason why he was actually in the Middle East in the first place was because he was looking for his real mom. So he had become an orphan when his mother died. They just say of an illness. I, it, I'm assuming it was cancer, just the way they kind of referred to some things in the comics. I can't remember if they specifically said that or not. But his father was like a career criminal, and he was murdered by Two-Face. And then he became an orphan, and then Batman found him. But during a death in the family, he goes back to his apartment, and a neighbor had kept some stuff for him and gave it to him. And he goes through and finds his birth certificate and realizes, even though there's some water damage on these documents, they re he realizes that his, the person whose name is listed as his mother was not the same name as the person that he thought was his mom. And he just knows that it, the first letter's S and everything else was smeared. And so, so he goes on a search for his mom. His list of possible mothers include an Israeli deep cover agent. Okay. Lady Shiva. Oh, okay. Yeah. And a doctor working in the Middle East on hunger relief. So he go and they're all in the Middle East. Yeah. And so, so he goes to the Middle East and Batman's kind of, I, I get him like, at this point in the comic, Joker has a nuclear weapon and Batman's trying to find him, but Jason's now run away 
and he has to choose, do I go help mm. Jason or find Jason, or do I go after the Joker? I have to go after the Joker. He has a nuclear weapon. Intellectually, I get it. But in the comic, it was just, it, he was kind of cold. It was just, it was interesting the way that they depicted him. Not, not the warm, loving Batman <laughs> we get in Young Justice. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, turns out his real mom, spoiler, you got your spoiler warning. Turns out his real mom was the, it was the MD. His real mom was not Lady Shiva or yes. the deep cover <laughs> Israeli agent. Well, not so much because uh, as part of that storyline, uh, Joker tries to sell the nuclear weapon. Uh, Batman and Jason both stop that. Joker goes to this doctor who is Jason's mom, apparently knew her from Gotham, as an underground criminal MD or something, because she lost her license because of an a- incident, blackmails her into do like giving him a bunch of supplies and stuff that he can sell in the black market to get money. I guess Jason tracks her down. It is his mom. She says she's in trouble. He tells her that she's ro- that he's Robin, and then she turns him over to Joker. And because she had been skimming, she had been embezzling money anyway. <sighs> And so if Robin took down Joker and they did an investigation, her embezzlement would have been found out. So she turns her son over to Joker. Of course, Joker's Joker on brand sticks her in the warehouse with him (laughs) to blow him up, to blow her up. And part of the reason why Jason doesn't get out of the warehouse is because he stops to untie her first. And then she helps him get to the door, but the door is locked and then it blows up. So... Again, it's this. It it actually showed this complicated side of Jason, Oof. which I think for me was confusing as a kid. It's like you're so angry all the time. You're just so angry and angst ridden. You just can't accept happiness in any way. But like, also the poor kid was spent all this time trying to find his mom, and like, you know, tries to save her even though she betrayed him to Joker and killed them both. Like, there's just a lot going on. So like, that obviously didn't show. But it would have been interesting if they had put this woman like in that opening scene and have part of the reason why he didn't get out in time was because he tried to get her out first. Mm. And then we would have... I'm wondering if there was a reason why they chose not to show that scene. Because it would have shown... Maybe maybe it would have shown that Jason had a softer side that they didn't want to have at the beginning until the end, which made that punch bigger when it was like the whole I would have chased him across the earth if he had taken oh, him from me. Yep. You know, I'm not I'm just I'm curious about that. If that was a if that was a discussion. Or if it was just too much. It was just like if it was just trying to keep it streamlined and just too much. But then when they're doing that, again, they're taking another female character out. So mm, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, I think putting in a the orphan and a, a deeper subplot of the orphan and his mother, I think, would have complicated it. I mean but Yeah. Anyway, well, I wanted to do a, a quick little mini uh, uh, Secret Origins, and then we can wrap everything up. All right, well, let's dive into, we, we've covered some of this stuff, but let's dive into a little mini Secret Origins on Red Hood specifically, because I'm hopeful that he will show up, mm-hmm. since we've already gotten a shot of Jason. Yeah. So the first appearance of Red Hood was in Detective Comics, the character of Red Hood in general. That means the Joker's original yes. Red Hood was Detective Comics number 161 back in February of 1951 called the man behind the red hood um so the man who would become the joker in that storyline is a lab assistant uh who wants to pull a big heist and retire after he'd been fired but after he gets cornered by the batman at this playing card factory he dives into a runoff vat of chemicals and is disfigured in most of the modern tellings um He ends up like falling accidentally or something happens and Batman tries to save him and it doesn't work. That's much more dramatic and interesting in my opinion. But then there's variations and retcon versions of Joker's origin that appear in The Killing Joke and Return of the Joker and uh, Batman the Man Who Laughs and other series. And it's kind of gotten to the point where it's just like, well, Joker never tells the same story twice. Yep. Which also makes sense, right? Versions of the Red Hood, both old and new, uh, also appear in a number of animated features, including... Uh, Batman Brave and the Bold, the Lego Batman movie. He's actually, I think, shown as a criminal where Joker turns all the bad guys in. I think he's actually in that group of people, which is really mm-hmm. weird if that's actually Jason. Video games, uh, Batman Arkham Knight. Uh, he's voiced by Troy Baker. Of course, in uh, uh, Justice League Injustice 2, he's voiced by a uh, friend of the show and Young Justice's own Tim Drake, Cam Bowen. Yep. 
Um, and then the Jason Todd Red Hood uh, from this beginning it kind of has gone through some changes in the recent years, becoming a little bit less of a psychopathic murderer, uh, at least in the new 52 Rebirth. Um, they had a series called Red Hood and the Outlaws, and uh, uh, where he's alongside Arsenal and Starfire, and he and Arsenal and Roy are actually really good friends, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, I have to do a quick correction. In the show, I've been calling this series Red Hood and the Outsiders, which is what I thought it was, um, but it's not. It's actually Red Hood and the Outlaws, so my mistake on that front, and I haven't read those. Um, so I don't know kind of how related they might be to the outsider storylines anyway. But that's pretty much it. That's kind of where he is right now. And then we're going to have to see what they end up doing with him on Young Justice. Well, I don't want to. Mm, yep. I just want to let it happen. I, I, part of me wants to to hope, but the rest of me just wants to say, be surprised. And here it comes. Because yep. I, I trust them with exactly all the things. I know Warner Brothers trust them with all the things. So I am ready my body, my body is ready. <laughs> my body is ready. I'm ready. I've prepared myself for this this intellectual and geeky workout. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. Well, I think we can wrap up this mission and Zeta out of the Watchtower. Uh, the best way to support the show, of course, is to share it with a friend. You can also leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Ratings and reviews push us up in the search strings and help new people find the show. Uh, and don't forget, you can now find all of our episodes divided into handy playlists at crashingthemode.com slash YouTube, with huge thanks to Ryan Bolter and Richard Kreutz Landry for helping us make that happen. And you can find all the links to the important information that we said there would be links to uh, in the show notes, <laughs> you know, and to the movie, the related comics that we talked about, and other things like this. And as always, if you enjoyed this episode and want to see more bonus content like this, please consider supporting us through Patreon at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.